Back in 1978, he was a young rookie, just happy to be in the bigs. And both George and uh, Harry Dalton have said that I've, I've earned a job, or at least a spot on this club, and that makes me feel real good that I know that I'm in the major leagues to stay. Paul Molitor's stay in the big leagues would include Rookie of the Year honors, all-star appearances, a trip to the World Series, and a 39-game hitting streak. But his career would also include more than its share of pain and injuries, and what he would now concede were some mistakes in judgment. The Paul Molitor of today is helping shape the baseball world of tomorrow. And while Molitor wants to play at least a few more years, he's also planning for a future after his playing days. On the next Sunday night, Paul Molitor on his career, the big business of baseball, and life outside the ballpark. And good evening again, and welcome to Sunday Night. I'm Mike Couché. Our guest tonight, Paul Molitor. Paul, good to have you here. Thanks. It's nice to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me. Let's uh, talk about uh, <laughs> the obvious here, the, the hand, the well, thumb. I'll, I'll tell you, it's uh, just another chapter of all the injuries that I've had to go through in uh, my 13 years here in Milwaukee, unfortunately. But the finger's doing pretty well. I'm looking forward to get back to playing here very, very shortly. Uh, another one of those freak accidents that just seem to have a way of finding me on a baseball field when you get your finger caught in a first baseman's glove. It's not something that happens every day. But it's doing pretty well. The injury seems to be healing, and again, hopefully I'll be back out there very shortly. Is that a lot of frustration for you, or does it in a way make you feel more privileged to play the game when you have well, an injury like this? It, it kind of goes both ways. I think when you first have an injury, naturally you go through the, the anger and the frustration, but um, I think I've always tried to maintain a perspective that, uh, you know, to be a major league player is a tremendous blessing. And I never try to lose sight of that. And so when you're away from the game, it helps reinforce that. And I try to use that also to encourage my teammates. Hey, don't, don't take for granted the fact that you're out there having an opportunity to play in major league games because you never know when it's going to be taken away from you. How frustrating uh, has this year been for you? You've had a couple of different injury bouts. And, right. and the team probably hasn't done as well as, as certainly the team members would have hoped or the fans would have hoped at this point. Well, I think uh, the last couple of years, the expectations for our club has really been growing. And uh, everyone keeps saying how the Brewers are on the verge of, of getting back to a World Series. And yet, each and every year as we get into the season, 50, 60, 70 games, we find ourselves trailing our division leader. And this year has been no exception. So it has been frustrating for the players and for the fans. And uh, again, it has to do with that expectation level. But... Uh, the, the club isn't giving up hope. We're, we realize we're in a somewhat weak division and we can possibly turn things around. But as you say, year in and year out, it gets frustrating to have to continually try to fight back uh, midway through the season rather than getting off to a good start. Uh, would make things a lot easier for us. We hear a lot about chemistry when they talk about the Brewers. What, what is the chemistry like on the ball club? Type ball club or is that a problem? Well, I'll tell you, I think baseball players generally have, have changed a lot since even when I came in the league 13 years ago. I think that... Uh, it was a lot easier back then to just focus on winning and pulling together and being a team. And as, as the game has changed and as the salary structure has changed and the fact that we've had such an influx of young players over the past uh, half a dozen years or so, uh, I think we've seen a change in attitude of players and it's a lot more difficult for them to focus on team things. It's, it becomes a lot easier to worry about when our arbitration eligibility comes around or how quickly can I get to this level of a salary and sometimes that can take away from the enjoyment of, of what a team means and I think we've seen that in all of baseball as well as here in Milwaukee. This past spring you were involved in a lot of those issues, right. the ones that you just raised as the American League representative in the, in the baseball talks. Sure. Uh, what kind of, a, of a, an experience was that for you? Was, was it a a good experience, or do you look back and say, boy, I don't, I don't know why I did that? Well, I'm, I'm glad that I did it. It uh, definitely turned out to be a lot more uh, of a strenuous job than I had uh, thought going into it. And really, personally, I didn't have a lot to gain by that last negotiation. I had a long-term contract, and pretty much uh, the changes that were made because of the new negotiation weren't going to affect my career. But for everything that the association had done for me in my 13 years, I thought it was a good opportunity being knowledgeable of the issues to try to give something back. And uh, again, as it, as it went on and the lockout continued and the focus became very large on myself and on Mr. Selig naturally being the head of the PRC, the, the owner's committee, and it became very strenuous. But 
I think thankfully that both of us were involved because I think our communication uh, throughout the talks uh, were an important part of the thing eventually being settled. And although it strained Mr. Sealy's relationship and mine at times, I think in the long run we grew closer because of it. Do you feel what happened this past spring with the lockout, with some of the, the uh, expressed dissatisfaction by both sides mm -hmm. over the way things were going, do you think it hurt the game at all? Well, I think that uh, the labor negotiation did have a negative effect somewhat, and some people you'll never get back after going through something like that. But I think what's had more of a negative effect on the fans, Mike, is just the fact that not only the negative tone of owner and player relationships, but the fact that the game has gotten so hard for the everyday fan to fathom as, as terms of revenue, not only generated by clubs, but also the amount of salaries that players are now receiving. And, uh, you know, as the game heads into the 90s and who knows from there, that's, that's one of my concerns, how we're going to resolve not only the, the, the problems that owners have with players, but uh, also the problems of salaries. In Major League Sports, the salaries have gotten so high and, and uh, the fans just can't relate to that. I don't even think the players can relate to it. And, you know, we're going out there and have to perform in front of fans every day. And, and as you can see here in Milwaukee, they're a lot more quick to criticize because uh, the expectations are higher because the dollars players are making. And they don't have that uh, patience as they used to. They expect players to almost to be machine-like in their performance. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with the compensation of players today. So somehow, some way in the future, maybe Mr. Seeley's idea of revenue sharing or some type of uh, salary structure will help alleviate these problems down the road. Do you and the other guys who, who, who play the game today you understand fans' resentment uh, these days when, when somebody sits there? And I'm sure there are people who say that about you. I mean, once in a while they say, hey, look, he's injured and he's br bringing down this big salary. You sure. know, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Well, I think I, I understand it to, to, to some degree. I think that this injury this year, I've had more negative response than I've had <laughs> injuries in the past. Again, it's, it's part of the expectation that you're making higher dollars and you don't have a right to be injured. And I just wish those people sometimes would stop and empathize. You know, would I rather be rehabbing during a course of a major league season when I know uh, it's a short, short career as it is, as opposed to being out there playing, which is something that I love to do and, and uh, miss very much when I'm injured. Uh, by choice, there's no doubt where I would rather be. But sometimes people have the impression that almost you enjoy the fact that you get away from playing and you can take some time off during the season when actually the opposite is the, is the truth. Do the injuries force you to think about the future a little sooner than maybe you'd like. I mean, all ball players want to play forever, I think. Uh, at right. least most of them do. Do the injuries make you say, hey, there's got to be something beyond this in a few years? Well, I think all the injuries that I've had have, have forced me to, to think down the line. And with the help, I think, of Mr. Selig, who's always tried to keep me aware of the fact that that transition someday will take place, who knows when. But I've had a lot of time to think about what I like to do. And, and basically, over the past oh, five or six years, I've realized baseball is what I know, Mike, and uh, for me to go out and try to do something away from that really wouldn't be natural. I've spent so much of my life preparing to be a player, and now that I've been around Major League Baseball for 13 years, I think that for me, the way I could be most useful and most constructive with my time is somehow to remain involved with the game of baseball. Any particular way that, that well, you're thinking about it? The way that I think of it, I, I have talked to Mr. Selig about may, staying in the Brewer organization, whether it be involving some type of, uh, you know, front office uh, position. Uh, I enjoy the, the challenge of not maybe managing on the field type of a job, but maybe putting an organization together, farm systems, and the shaping of a major league team and what it takes uh, to become champions. So the personnel decisions sure. appeal to you? It really it. does, and I think that, uh, you know, that would be something that I would enjoy the challenge of. And uh, hopefully that's a few years away, but I think that's a uh, direction that I'm leading towards. You talk like a man who, who's in Milwaukee, hopefully, for the rest of his career. You have a three-year agreement right now that, Correct. that you signed. Right. You had the chance, did you not, to, to become an unrestricted free agent after a year. You, you could have gone that route, my right. understanding is. Why did you decide not to? You know you probably could have made still more money. Well, uh, the money, you know, I, it's, it's probably, some people say it's easy for, me, easy for me to say it isn't a factor because I do have a very very fine contract, but I've had a few chances in my career uh, to leave uh, through the free agent route back in 1982. Um, I could have played out my option and been a free agent, and again in 1987 I was a free agent, but uh, that was during the collusion period. And uh, of course if I would have had a, played out this season and not signed a three-year contract, I could have been one again. 
But, uh, you know, I think players like myself who have enjoyed the relationships that I've built in Milwaukee with ownership and with fans and the opportunities that I've had here, I just have never really had much of a desire to go elsewhere. Um, it's been a comfortable place for me to play. I think I've been well respected here uh, by, you know, by fans and by management. I've been treated very fairly. And uh, for me to go somewhere just to see if the grass was greener on the other side just never really was very appealing to me. And uh, like you mentioned, I do hope to finish my career here, however much longer that will be. And in this day and age, to have a 13, 14, 15 plus year career and playing one set, one town your whole career, that's a rare opportunity. And it's something that I'm thankful for. Okay. Let's take a break. We're going to come back and continue with Paul Molitor on Sunday night in just a moment. Uh, it's been a real treat. It's been a learning experience. Uh, guys in our ball club that have their experiences wearing off of myself. And, uh, you know, I've seen maybe 25, 30 pro games on, on my entire life. And now to have played 120 this season and uh, just seeing these ball players doing the job day in and day out, it's been a great experience for me. your comfort level in Milwaukee is something that they said you feel very comfortable in this community. But a person out there might say, hey, this guy could have gone to a New York or a Los Angeles uh, and, and not only made a, a darn good salary playing baseball, but the commercial endorsements would have come in piles. You would have had to pick and choose. Well, Any appeal to you? I think there's some curiosity as to what it would be like to have an opportunity to be, you know, highly visible in the market area, uh, representing things. But uh, not enough curiosity to really want to make a change. And again, when you're happy where you're at, just to go out there and, and check something out and possibly do be disappointed, it, it wasn't worthwhile for me. And uh, when I think of players that I see a lot in commercials and doing various things and appearances, you know, it makes me wonder of their, of their time. It seems to me, even in Milwaukee, it's a, it's a smaller community. And, you, you feel like you're giving a lot of your time back, doing a lot of things, and if you start spreading it even that much more thinner with uh, commercial endorsements and appearances like that, it cuts away from family time. And um, the way it's set up right now, I think that's probably the most ideal way for me, and that's just to remain here. I would say you're not, while you're in, in Milwaukee, you know, while we may not see Paul Muller on TV every day during the off season, you're still doing some things that some people know about and some don't. Right. Uh, one of the things you're doing is you're speaking to kids. You're, you're spending time speaking to kids about the dangers of drugs. Right. Why is that remain an important thing for Paul Molitor to do? Well, Mike, I think a lot of the young kids now that I do speak to probably don't remember back about eight, nine, ten years ago when my names were my, my name was brought up in the uh, case of a, a drug dealer here in town and uh, having experienced drugs on a personal level uh, back in the early part of my career. I've always felt that through the experiences that I went through I am with a position that I've been blessed with as a major league player that somehow I might be able to affect some pe people's lives, some young people's lives in a positive fashion. And although it took me a number of years to get comfortable with, with dealing with that on a reality basis, um, I thought it was more important over the long run to get over my personal uncomfortableness to try to help some people out. And like you said, we've gone out to the high schools and we've put together a videotape that we're using now. Uh, around the high schools uh, around the state and I just try to get out there and share my experiences the curiosities that I had maybe some of the reasons that I got involved with drugs and if I can share that with people and tell them how wrong I was in making those decisions and try to offer some bio, you know some constructive uh, 
alternatives for these young people. Uh, hopefully I can help some kids out. And it's been amazing the response that we've received. The kids uh, seem to, for some reason or other, Mike, you know how they look up to athletes. And uh, when they hear it coming from you directly, face to face, it seems to have quite a, an impression. And so hopefully we're, we're helping some kids out there. What I learned, and thank God, that he was able to pull me out of that situation before I got myself in too deep. And I learned that the only way to avoid problems with these type of things is to say no. Flat and simple, when you get older and you get exposed to it, say no. You see uh, in the headlines most days, uh, the most recent example was the Cleveland State basketball coach, a guy like Kevin Mackey, who, whose life is in shambles right now. Um, when you look back on, on, on your experience uh, with drugs, Paul, do you say, uh, boy, I could have really ended up in serious, serious trouble, or do you feel that it was just something that was a, a short flirtation and then, then you moved on? I'd like to think that it was a flirtation, but really it was more than that. Because as I think back, there's no question I reached a dangerous level a, a few times. And uh, I think that realizing, first of all, that it wasn't what God wanted me to be doing more than anything, realizing that I was not only risking relationships, but risking my career, uh, risking my life, that finally the message got through that I had to put that chapter behind me. But not by any means was it uh, something that was just a short-term thing. There was a couple-year period there where it was on and off, and it was, seemed like it was more commonplace for athletes to be experimenting at that time in the early 80s, and uh, we didn't really have the knowledge that we do now. But uh, as I look back, I'm very thankful that I was able to get through it, uh, not only to continue my career, but uh, again, it could have even went worse than that. How has drug use in baseball changed from, from what you've seen in, in, uh, in social gatherings, clubhouse? It would sure. appear to me that there is far less drug usage today than there well, was. Well, thankfully, Mike, we don't, see, we don't see much of the news anymore about players with pot or coke or anything like that. It's pretty much uh, been put to rest, I think. I think young players now realize from what they've seen, you know, they've seen athletes uh, you know, go to jail, they've seen athletes die, they've seen a lot of... Uh, tremendously negative things happen and they realize that there's so much more to gain and through the education and what they've been able to see firsthand uh, through news reports they realize now that the risk is far too great and because of that thankfully I think we've seen a tremendous decline in drug use in professional athletes and my personal experience I never seen anymore and uh, maybe I'm hanging around the right places finally after all these years but thankfully I think that problem is pretty much behind us in professional sports. What about steroids? We always hear the Jose Canseco uh, mm -hmm. uh, story and he seems to have to answer that charge just about every other week. Uh, uh, is that a problem? Well, I'm a little bit naive in that area because naturally it wasn't a big thing when I was first coming up. And it seems now the problem with steroids goes almost down into the high school levels and kids trying to do it early. But if it's around in professional baseball players, it's very isolated. And again, I'm not knowing enough about the symptoms to be able to pick them out in certain players. Uh, I just don't see it happening. And Canseco and some of the rumors like that, who knows? You know, I, I just... I would never accuse somebody of not having any facts, but uh, hopefully if it is out there, it's isolated and, and people will learn that uh, that is something that can't be tolerated as well. What's your perspective on this? Does, does professional sports um, almost encourage a person to, to dabble in it, in, in drug usage? And I, and I say that because, number one, the pressure that's involved, number two, the money mm -hmm. that, made, that is made, and number three, the the fact that, that you're expected to play every day with the little injuries, with the little pain, sure. uh, shot a cortisone here, whatever, to play with it. Do all of those things add up to an increased pressure on an athlete to at least experiment with drug usage, you feel? Well, I think what, what does to athletes more than anything uh, increases their desire to experiment or dab or whatever you want to say is the fact that so much of the focus is, uh, is on them and a pressure to perform at a high level in front of a lot of people regularly that when they get away from that environment they don't want to have to deal with it. I think you know people use drugs for a lot of reasons whether it be you know an escape or curiosity or whatever it might be. To me the main thing with athletes is an escape because there's such a pressure of trying to perform in a public environment in a public arena that when it's time to have their time away they, they just need to isolate themselves and I, to me that's, that's where the problems uh, begin with drug uses for press, professional athletes. But speaking of the kids is very rewarding, isn't it? Well, yeah. it, no question it is because you, you, when you're speaking and you can see that they're tuned into you and they're really listening to what you have to say, what surprises me 
is, is how young these kids are and how much knowledge they have at that young age about drugs, whether it be talking through friends or from their parents or whatever. They know what it's about, and uh, they're paying attention to you, so it is very rewarding. When we come back, and we're going to take one more break, we come back, I want to ask Paul about uh, maybe a career in this business. Who knows? Maybe <laughs> you'd be doing a show like this in the near future. We'll be right back on Sunday night in just a moment. Even though it is a lockout and the owners are calling the shot, that we all have a responsibility to our customers out there and somehow, some way, some shape or form getting the game back on the field as quickly as we can. A few years ago, and I'm testing my memory now, I think it was on ABC, right. we saw Paul Molitor going over the opposing team's lineup, sure. uh, strengths, weaknesses. Uh, how'd you like TV? Something you want to do more of? Well, I was, I was curious enough to try to get some experience, and ABC gave me an opportunity a couple of years running to do some commentary on opposing players, and it was, it was interesting. And I also did some things for the Twins during their World Series year up in the Twin Cities. Uh, it was enjoyable, but I felt very, very nervous being on the other side. I think in responding to questions, I've become somewhat comfortable over the years, but trying to be the one on the other side was a little bit difficult. And plus having someone talking in your ear while you're trying to talk, that's something that took a while to get accustomed People to. People don't so. understand that, that there are little voices in yeah, your was, ear from time to that time. That was tough. Yeah. But who knows, maybe sometime I might give another chance down the road. You mentioned doing some uh, work for the Twins during World Series. Uh, is that one of the highlights, the, the team's appearance in your career, when you look back at this stage of your career and say the things that you're most proud of? Is, that would obviously be one, I would guess. There's no doubt, and I know it's somewhat of a cliche to people that as a player, you know, first of all, your dream is to get to the major leagues. But after that, you're, when you, as a kid, you dream about being in a World Series. Uh, you don't dream about, you know, winning batting titles or things like that. You, what it's like to win a World Series. So, 82, although we came up short, that was definitely the highlight. And, uh, you know, just everything that happened that year with Robin's tremendous year and the managerial change when Harvey took over and the way we were able to, you know, go down to the wire and win it in Baltimore and the playoff series against the Angels. I mean, there was just so much drama to that year and unfortunately we ended up on the short end but uh, as a player whose goal is to win a World Series that was the highlight of my career. Let's go back a few years prior to 1982. 1978 Paul Molitor a rookie in Major League Baseball. You were talking about that earlier that's a thrill. Right. Well I think when you when you talk about personal highs uh, first obtaining the taste of being a major league player, you know, getting the uniform on and getting out there on a major league field. And for me, it happened in kind of a strange way because in spring training in 1978, I was expected to go to AAA and basically had been outrighted to Spokane, which was our AAA club at the time. But Robin came down with an injury a week before spring training and I found myself back in major league camp and six days later, I was the opening day shortstop. So it was a matter of things happening very quickly for me and I was just fortunate enough that once I get my, got my foot in the door, uh, I got off to a good start and Robin eventually came back and I got shifted to second base, which was kind of a sign of things to come, mm -hmm. position changes, but uh, it was a great way to start off my career, opening day in Milwaukee and uh, being well received and having a pretty good day too. Now we'll jump to 1987, 39 game hitting streak, uh, best hitting streak in modern history anyhow, mm -hmm. since really since Jolton Joe and all the other folks. I don't think we're probably going to see too many people hit 39 games in a row anymore. Do you, would you agree? Well, I, I don't mean to, you know, blow smoke or anything, but I just think that today's, you know, with the specialty of pitching and the travel, and uh, of course, I think the most difficult thing about the streak, as I look back, was the media attention. We didn't see that, uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, and now things become, you know, so enlarged that uh, they have a tendency to build in some extra pressure that maybe not even is really non-existent so uh, it's difficult for a player to go through like that because again you're trying to keep your focus on winning and con contributing and yet everyone else is telling you that what you're doing is more important so uh, it'll be tough for someone to, to go ahead and challenge Joe's record someday but if they do it'll be very exciting times for the game of baseball. You got about a half a minute uh, left here uh, once again hand injury when, when do you hope to be back? Well, if things keep going, you know, I'm starting to try to swing a bat. I'm hoping to play by the end of the month on August 1st at the latest. So that'll give me the last 65 games or so. Um, you know, I don't want to rush this thing and have a setback of, of re-fracturing the finger or anything. So I'm trying to use them in common sense as well. But I'm getting real anxious to play. It's tough to sit back and watch, when, especially when you love to be out there playing. Yeah. All right. 
want to thank you again for being here tonight. You know, I, I really enjoy watching your show. It's been a pleasure <laughs> for me to come out and visit with you a little bit. All right. I appreciate okay? it, Paul. All right. That's Paul Molitor, and that's Sunday night for this night. Thanks very much for being with us. I'll see you again tomorrow at 5 and 6.